Jesus, he has been so good to me. Oh, bless your name, Jesus. Come on, open up your mouth and thank him. Thank him for being good. Thank him for being your friend. Thank him for being a protector. Thank him for saving you. Thank you for keeping you. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. Come on, open up your mouth and give him glory. 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 Give him what's due. Give him what's due. Give him what's due. Give him what's due. He has been so good to me. Oh, he has been so good to me. Come on, make it personal today. Oh, he has been so good to me. Come on, think about it. Oh, he has been so good to me. Come on, then find somebody and tell them. He has been so good to you. Oh, he has been so good to you. Oh, we praise it right now. Oh, he has been so good to us. Oh, we bless your name, Jesus. We magnify your name, Jesus. Oh, you have been so good to us. Oh, he has been so good to me. Come on and just slip your hands and give God glory. Give God praise. Come on, slip them up and give God glory. Give him praise from your heart, from your belly, from your soul. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. Glory, glory. Everybody bless the Lord. Everybody bless the Lord. He has been so good. He has been so good. He has been so good. Better to me than I could ever be to myself. Hallelujah. He's been so good. He's been so good. Stand with me, everybody, and come and join me at the altar for this moment of prayer. We're praying for our loved ones, our families, our children, our grandchildren, our sons and daughters with the faith that God has all of them in his hands. You know the Bible says that all souls belong to God. You don't have to worry because the souls belong to God. What we're praying for is open eyes, open hearts, open spirits, that when God begins to draw, they will heed the call of God upon their lives. I believe that everyone attached to me can be saved. Anybody believe that? Anybody believe that everybody attached to me can be saved? And here's why I say it. The Bible says, the promise is unto you, to your children, to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He's going to call them. 
They might have a different agenda. They might have different plans. They might have different purposes. But I believe that God's going to call them. Hey, God. Fix that person. Fix that person in your spirit right now. Who you want the Lord to save. Who you want the Lord to deliver. Who you want the Lord to make whole. Lord, let me say thank you. Thank you because you're good to me. You're good to us. You have blessed us. You have favored us. You have kept us and sustained us. And Lord, for that and so many other things, we are grateful. Lord, we stand in this house right now thanking you that you saved us. Lord, we weren't always saved. We weren't always in the ark of safety. We've been outside of your grace and your mercy, but yet you saved us. And God, if you can save us, you can save our sons, you can save our daughters, you can save our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, because there is nothing too hard for you, God. Today I lift up families right now, families of all sorts, shapes, sizes, go oh God, dynamics and complexions, but God, I lift up families, mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, I lift up grandparents, I lift up husbands and wives, marriages today, God. Lord, stretch out your hand of deliverance, stretch out your hand of mercy, stretch out your hand of grace. God, deal with our frustrations, deal, my God, with our loneliness, deal with our lack, deal Deal with our separation. Deal with whatever is hindering us, God. Lord, have your way right now. God, remember. We bind the hand of the enemy right now. That will come to frustrate, to anger, to hurt, to kill, destroy. We call the devil a liar right now. And we believe that you are able now. So God, touch now. Feed us from your table today. Give us the word that we need to hear, edify and strengthen us and bless now, God. Your word touch somebody today, deliver somebody today, set somebody free today, break a yoke for somebody today, bind the enemy right now today. As you do it, we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. In Jesus' name, everybody praise the Lord right now. Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody. Everybody, everybody, everybody. Everybody. God bless you. Please return to your seats and join us in the book of Numbers. Join us in the book of Numbers. Join us in the book of Numbers. And as we did last Sunday, remain seated because there's a lot of reading in this text. So I want to ask you to stand for all of the reading but I will ask you to join me in Numbers chapter 12 and we're going to read the text in its entirety and this morning I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible from Numbers chapter 12 beginning at verse 1 when you have it would you say amen Numbers chapter 12 and verse number 1. Now Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, or he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, and I'm reading from the Amplified Bible, has the Lord really spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken also through us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man, Moses, was very humble, gentle, kind, devoid of self-righteousness, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. 
Suddenly the Lord said unto Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting, tabernacle. And the three of them came out. And the Lord came out of the pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tabernacle. And he called Aaron and Miriam, and they came forward. And he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision, and I will speak to him in a dream. But it is not so with my servant Moses. He is entrusted and faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth directly, clearly and openly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Miriam and Aaron, and he departed. And when the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. And Aaron turned and looked at Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Then Aaron said unto Moses, O my Lord, I plead with you, do not account this sin to us, in which we have acted foolishly, in which we have sinned. O oh, do not let her be like one dead already half decomposed when he comes from his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Heal her, please, O God, I plead with you. But the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut out outside the camp for seven days, and afterwards she may return. So Miriam was shut outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move until Miriam was brought in again and declared ceremonially clean from her leprosy. Afterward, the people moved on from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Everybody lift your hands and say, Lord, heal my dysfunctional house. Hallelujah. Lord, heal my dysfunctional house. We started this last Sunday um, concerning spiritual and family relationships. And I believe that it is Satan's goal, is Satan's aim, is Satan's um, purpose to render every family dysfunctional, spiritual and natural family. And he goes about it a variety of ways and a variety of tactics. But the goal is that we cease to function at which God has designed. I, I believe two things, and I think the word bears me out, that everything a person needs can be found in a functional family. Anybody believe that? Ambition, life, strength, purpose, all of that can be found in a functional family. I believe the same thing applies to the spiritual family. That is not the size of the church, is not the number of people in the congregation, but if the church is functional, people can find everything they need in the house of God. The reason why people stray and vary is either because they don't believe it or because they have not seen it. And in so many cases, the church has lived less than their purpose. Families have lived less than their purpose. And that being said, it creates the dysfunction that permeates, permeates. You know, um, I, I will debate with you whether or not there's such a thing as a generational curse uh, in grace. I'll debate that. Simply because I believe that if people got over their stuff, they could break the curse. All right, somebody missed that. If people could get past whatever it is they're fighting with, whatever it is they're struggling with, whatever it is that is interfering with God's purpose for their lives, that will bring an end to the curse. Some of us have to get better because people are looking at us right now. We got to get better. Our children are looking at us, and they've watched us walk in and out of church. They've watched us go to church. They've watched us perform in church. But have they really seen the church act in us? They, they've seen us at church, but have they seen the impact of our faith upon our lives? 
Because when people can see the impact, it provides faith to them. And that's why I'm telling everybody that's a husband or a wife or a mother or a father, you have to live this the right way. You have to, because even if you don't think your kids are looking, they're looking. Even if you don't think your little nephew or your niece or your cousin or whoever's in your family is watching, trust and believe they are watching. And they are watching with the intent to see, does this stuff work or does it not work? People come into the congregation, people come into the sanctuary, and they hear the rhetoric, but I have to say, in all honesty, sometimes what they hear in the rhetoric is not lived out in the seats. Come on, somebody. Sometimes it's not lived out in the pulpit. And so there's a cynicism about church. And that's why when people have in their um, encouragement or their praise said, Bishop Davis, I want to be like you, I tell them, aim higher. I tell them, aim higher, simply because I, I, I know I'm saved, I know I'm blessed, I know I'm anointed and all that stuff, but guess what? Still got some flaws. Lord, help me preach this. Still got some stuff I'm struggling with. Still have my ups and my downs, my highs and my lows. And so I, I'm encouraging you what the Bible says, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm encouraging you as the Bible says, beloved, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be what? Like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purify of himself. Because I know my goal is to be like the Lord, I'm striving to purify myself. Now, now I'm going to say this, we spend most of our time most of our energy, most of our talk time and think time, talking and trying to purify others and spend so little time on ourselves. And if you spent that same energy that you took to talk about this one, to talk about that one, to pray about whatever your own needs were, you'd see deliverance break out in your life. The people that sometimes get delivered are the folks that stop talking and start praying because they need to see the move of God in their lives. I want to pick up on the text, because I got everywhere but the text on last Sunday. And I ch the Lord gave me this text because I think it speaks to the spiritual and the natural family. Because if you understand, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron were brothers and sisters. Everybody know that, right? They, they were family. They were family. And, and you would suspect or you would think intuitively that if they were family, that they would be aligned not only emotionally, but they would also be aligned spiritually because all three of them were anointed. But, but I need to tell you, sometimes anointed families are the most challenged. All right, y'all ain't got to say amen, but I'm... Sometimes anointed families are the most challenged. Sometimes in the family unit and in the church, the anointed people can be the most challenged people. Because even though, and this is the first point I want to make, you can be spiritual and still exist in a state of dysfunction. Okay. I, I prepare for y'all to look at me today, so just keep on looking. You, you, you can be spiritual, you can pray every day, you can read your Bible, know your Bible, you can preach, teach, sing, minister, work in the kitchen and do all this stuff and still find yourself in a state of dysfunction. That's why the Bible says watch as well as pray. Now, now, now some folks think, oh, I'm watching for the devil. No, you're watching you. If you're praying, you have to watch you. And one of the struggles is that we pray sometimes looking through the window instead of looking through the mirror. Because if I pray looking out the window, I'm praying for everybody else's stuff. I know this one is a liar, and this one is a fornicator, and this one is an adulterer, and this one gossips, and this one drinks, this one smokes. But I never look at the mirror. Because if I pray and look through the mirror, I'm going to be forced to look at myself. 
I'm going to be forced to examine myself. And what you have here are three spiritual people that are family, but are dysfunctional family. And, and if I had the time to analyze the relationship between Moses and Miriam and Aaron, it would be simply that Moses was not raised with Miriam and Aaron. He was raised in Egypt. Come on, somebody. So he had the benefits of the Egyptian educational system. He had the benefits of the wealth of Egypt. And Miriam and Aaron were raised as slaves. Now, how many dysfunctions do we have in families because Junebug was raised by grandma and the other three were raised by mom and dad? And Junebug is, well, even though grandma was good and grandma took care of things and grandma made sure he wanted for nothing, Junebug is always wondering what was wrong with me that, that mom and dad didn't raise me. Now, Junebug is 50, but he's still struggling over why mom and dad didn't raise me. The rest of the family, well, you had it made. Grandma ain't had no grass to cut. Grandma didn't have a field. Grandma didn't have a garden. Grandma didn't live in the hood. Grandma didn't do this. Grandma just took care of you. And grandma loved you because she raised you. Do any of these stories sound familiar? These are the realities. And, and now I want to put this in context as well. Moses was at least 80 years old when this happened. And I don't know chronologically who was older, Moses or Miriam or Aaron. I really don't know. I should have, I should have studied and told y'all, but I don't really know. But they were all either octogenarians or close to it. Come on, somebody. Which tells me that some of this mess doesn't get resolved when you turn 18. It doesn't get resolved when you turn 20. And if y'all sit around that family reunion long enough, all of that old stuff is going to come out. Come on, somebody. And it starts out playing, and then it becomes serious, and then somebody gets mad and takes their potato salad and goes home because somebody brought up something from the past. If I'm wrong, take the mic. So they're carrying this dysfunction because... And then on top of that, not only was Moses raised in luxury, but he got to be the one in charge. Why didn't the Lord call Aaron in Goshen? Why didn't the Lord call Miriam? He got to pick Moses, the smart one, the rich one, the one that seemed to be head and shoulders above the rest. Now, the problem with dysfunction is that you go looking for something to fuss about. Come on, some. It ain't got to be anything. It doesn't have to be anything real. It can be imagined, but you create something where there is nothing. And Miriam, and because if you read the context, she seemed to be the ringleader in all of this, Miriam got mad because of who Moses married. Now, we don't know if this was Zipporah, who was the daughter of Jephro, or did Zipporah die and Moses married another woman, but there was something about this new wife. Now, if it was Zipporah, this is real pitiful because that means she'd been holding this mess for 40 years. All right? I'm going to assume that Zipporah died and Moses chose, your Bible says, an Ethiopian woman. He chose a black woman, and he married her and brought her home. Come on, somebody. And now, okay, now I got something. Come on, somebody. I never liked Moses anyway. Y'all ain't going to say that. He always got on my nerves anyway. Now he done married somebody that don't look like us. What's wrong with all women? Y'all done had that same conversation. Why he had to marry why did she have to marry him? All these good brothers, and she had to find somebody that don't look like us. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I know this is Black History Month, but I'm going to give y'all some real black history, all right? There's a resentment that comes to the forefront 
because Moses did something that they did not approve of. Now, I need to tell you this, and you may not like it, but it's true. Everybody ain't got to approve of what you do. The only standard of approval or disapproval is the word of God. Everything else is opinion. And your opinion is just as good as mine. It's just as valid as mine. And some days I just need to keep my opinion to myself. Because if it's not going to edify, if it's not going to strengthen, if it's not going to help, why am I sharing my opinion with everybody that will listen just to create a cloud? Well, there is no cloud. Miriam, and I don't know who else Miriam talked to, but we know she talked to Aaron. And Aaron co-signed. Some of us don't say nothing, but we nod too much. Lord, help me preach this. We, 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 don't, we don't agree verbally, and we'll say, I didn't say nothing, but you kept doing this. You kept doing this. You kept doing this. So whether Aaron co-signed verbally or whether he co-signed non-verbally, Aaron was very much engaged in the process. But if you go back and look in your Bible, the Bible says that God heard them. Now, I need y'all to put that in your spirit. That evil speaking is something that God will stop what he's doing and pay attention to because God knows the power of the spoken word. That's why you got to be careful what comes out of your mouth. You know why some folks aren't blessed? Because the wrong stuff comes out of their mouth. Bible says from the same mouth we put out blessings and curses. From the same mouth, from the same mouth, we say thank you, Jesus, and your mama. From the same mouth. There's a lot of scripture, and I wish I had the time to just deal with the, the, the negativity of earthly speaking. But when you get home, read the book of James, where James says that you can control the ship, you can control the horse, but you can't control the tongue because the tongue is set on the fire of hell. I need somebody in here like me that has to watch your mouth. Come on, somebody, because if you open your mouth, you got some words in your mouth, and you ain't got to cuss, but you can cut people low with the words that come out of your mouth. And if the words aren't edifying, if the words aren't nurturing, if the words aren't helping, why are they coming out of the mouth of somebody that says they've been born again? Here's why we speak in tongues. We speak in tongues because that moment you're talking in tongues, you can't gossip. That moment you talking in tongues, you can't lie. That moment you talking in tongues, you can't run nobody down. And I believe God wants us to speak in tongues as much as we can so it'll control the English that comes out of our mouths. So, here is Moses being verbally attacked, follow me, by his two closest spiritual advisors because both Miriam and Aaron were anointed. Aaron was the priest. That means he was the intercessor. Miriam was the prophetess. She's the one when they crossed over the Red Sea, got that tambourine and started singing about Pharaoh's army, got drowned in the sea. Miriam was the singer and she was a prophetess. But you know, when you come out of the spirit, you have to watch what happens in between those times when God is using you and when you're just you. Everybody got the you time. You know, when you're doing the laundry, the car washed, watching TV, hanging out with friends. But you have to be very careful because what you do in your downtime impacts how God uses you when the anointing is upon your life. Now, the Bible says this very clearly, that they, just, they complained about Moses, they talked about Moses. And I don't know if Moses knew anything about this, but the Bible says God heard them. Now, write that down, type it in your phone, do something with it, do something with it right now. 
and say God heard them. Now, what is God hearing out of us when we are not in the house of God? See, we ain't dangerous in the church because we've been socialized in church. But it's when we're outside of the congregation, when we're not among the saints, when we're not among the people, or with, when we're with our clique, because everybody got a clique, and they're the people that we kind of hang out with and talk to and eat with at the church. What is God hearing in those conversations? Because it upset, now remember, this was them complaining, and here's the statement they made. Is Moses the only one that God anointed? And I know, and you know, I was reluctant to preach this because I don't ever want to do fear-driven preaching. But there are some curses that fall on people because of what they say about other people. You know, I, 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 I had to apologize to my daughter because she was sharing some things with me about just interacting and how people talk and how people act and how people behave. And I was initially dismissive of it. I said, well, baby, don't talk about you. Talked about Jesus, get over it. But then I remembered, I had to go back about 30 years in my life when I was about her age. And I remembered how painful it was to be in church with people that was shouting with me and then talking about me. Now, we can act like it doesn't matter because maybe some of us have gotten over it, but it's a painful thing to have somebody lay hands on you and then find out that they've been running you down out of the church. That's a painful thing. Why? Because I thought you loved me. And if you love me, you would talk to me and not about me. Oh, I'm preaching hard today. Y'all may as well write it down. I'm preaching hard today. How can you say you love me? And you use your words to discredit me. And this was damaging. And we don't, I don't know, I don't have any context of them talking about Moses other than among themselves. But here's what didn't happen. Aaron didn't stop Miriam. And Miriam didn't stop Aaron. So they fed into each other. They fed into each other. And it was all about they didn't like who Moses married. So they made a whole issue out of this woman. Amplified Bible calls her a Cushite. Ethiopian. She knows she, I, she just didn't look like Moses. And they had a problem. You know, um, I married Charity out of the way of the cross church. She wasn't from Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ. And there were folks in Cool JC that said, why did he have to go all the way to the way of the cross? When we got all these women in Cool JC. See, you can, you can build bondage anywhere. You can build a barrier anywhere. And I brought my innocent, you know, loving wife to these meetings. And women who I didn't know even like me were rolling their eyes at her. Come on, somebody. We were standing in church. I'm going to tell this story because it's true. We were standing in church. And Charity was standing by the door. A young woman walked by, looked down, looked for her foot, and stepped on it. Speaking in tongues, y'all ain't saying nothing. Come on. See, 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 I, I, I'm going to tell y'all this. It's a miracle that we're even still saved. Let me just tell the truth. It's the hand of God that we'll still save. And that's why I had to apologize to my daughter because I had overcome this 30 years ago. Because if you go through enough hell, you get tired of who talking, who saying, who doing, who don't like you. You just want to please God. But it doesn't make it right. 
And how many people don't make it because of evil speaking? How many people backslide because of evil speaking? How many people walk away, not just from a church, but from Jesus Christ altogether? Because they say, if those are your children, I don't want them and I don't want you. That's why your Bible says we are living epistles. You don't just represent yourself. You represent everybody that claims the same faith that you have. You just don't represent your family, your name, your title. You represent everything about God. That's why it matters how we deal with each other and it matters how we treat each other. And just for the evil speaking, this point I want to make. When you're dysfunctional, you become easily distracted by the wrong things. We're supposed to be about transforming people's lives. We're supposed to be about helping people come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if what you're talking about doesn't lend itself to that. Why are you talking about it? Whenever I go to meetings and I see conflict break out, and, and, it, 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 and trust me, it's from the top to the bottom. It ain't, it, ain't, it ain't germane to any particular sect of the church or part of the church. I always ask myself this question, but who got saved today? While we were verbalizing our distresses and our functions and our gripes and our issues, who got saved? See, see, that's why, and I'll be honest, I, I, I don't like a lot of conflict in my house. And like every other family, Charity and I have argued. Reggie and I have argued. Geneva and I have argued. Charity and Geneva have argued. Reggie and Geneva have argued. I remember one time, I'm going to tell this story, don't don't get mad at me. One of them came in, I I think it was Geneva. She came in the room crying and hollering. I said, what's wrong? Joel just called me a no-neck monster. (laughs) It was you, right? Okay. And and so, you know, at at first we had to to stop laughing because it was funny. I'm not going to lie. And Geneva, if you're watching, I'm sorry, baby. All right. It was funny. But then we realized no matter how funny it was, it was still painful. And we say things that are funny, but they take us, we end up talking and getting distracted by the wrong things. What we should have been focused on was it's not right for you to insult your sister. And it's not right for your sister to insult you. Because I believe Geneva had said something in front of the no-neck monster comment. But I don't know where he got that from. Y'all can ask him after church where he got that from. All right? But the point is, is that it distracts us from what we should really be talking about. And, And then on top of that, evil speaking does more damage than we are aware of. Who stopped preaching because somebody talked about Who stopped singing because somebody talked about them? Who put down their mantle of service because somebody started talking about them? So if you're the evil speaker, you're not just responsible, who I hear you, Holy Ghost, for them, you're responsible for everybody that would have been impacted by their ministry and that blood is on your hands. It's deeper than that one person. Now, let me just put some word to this so y'all say he just talking. Touch not my anointed. Do my prophet no harm. And the anointed is more than the pastor or the bishop or the missionary president. Everybody in here that's got the Holy Ghost is the anointed of God. 
And we've got to be careful how we handle. I hear you, I hear you. Lord, I hear you. What if we handle people based upon what they had in them instead of what we see out of them? We tend to handle people based upon what we see about them. And we don't have clue as to what the Holy Ghost is trying to do in their lives. Now, we don't have a clue, but the enemy has a clue. I hear you, Holy Ghost. The enemy knows the potential that is in everybody in this congregation. So let me kill you. I hear you, Lord. Let me kill you before you be what God destined you to become let me kill you while you're just praying about it let me kill you while you're just working on it let me kill you while you're fasting on it because that's the way to do the most damage do the most damage and the evil speaking got now think about this now God got involved in a sibling dispute between three prophets. It must be important. Now I know people will say, oh it don't matter. It matters. And if it doesn't matter to you, it matters to God. I get it, some of us, like I said, I, I, I've developed a tolerance. I've been lied on and talked about so much that if it ain't happening, I'm wondering what's wrong with me. But that's where I am almost 50 years in. But what happens to the babes? What happens to the new souls trying to get to Jesus? And they can't get to Jesus for all of the negative rhetoric that is coming out of people that say they know Jesus. Well, God heard them. Go to the next slide. And God makes a statement that I think is very important. We are all equal, but we are not all the same. And what he said to them, he said, yeah, you, Oops. I give you dreams, I give you visions, I share stuff, you're not the same as Moses. I don't think I'm better than anybody. In fact, I struggle with the places where God has taken me. But if God has brought me to this place, I can't let the church disrespect the office. It ain't about Reggie Davis. It is not about Reggie Davis. Reggie Davis is an ordinary person. But God has placed some of us in important places in the kingdom of God. And yes, we are all equal before God, but we are not all the same. And we have to be careful how we handle each other wherever we are. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says preferring one another. Come here, Candace. The Bible says preferring one another. Candace and I, come on, walk with me. We're equals. We're believers. But if we prefer one another, when we get to this door, because I prefer Candace, I'm going to say you go first. We at the same door. We're equals. But if we prefer each other, and because of who she is, she's going to say, no, pastor, you go first. And we'll be like them two little chipmunks on the cartoons. No, you go. No, you go. No, you. That, that was the same way Nettie and Shirley... Ramsey used to be. That they, they, they really loved each other like that. That they preferred each other and they would rather the other one go. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Before the other. Thank you. When, when, when you really love the people of God, I'm going to give you a hard one. You need a blessing. But your brother needs a blessing. And you say to God, God, you can delay mine. So my brother can have his. Oh God, when we start preferring each other, we'll say you go first. I want to see you blessed first. I want to see you delivered first. Because the biblical standard is that we prefer one another. 
second piece of this. That attacks within the family angers God. God is angry when children disrespect their parents, including grown children. Just because you're 18, you ain't stopped being a child. You somebody's child. Be glad you're somebody's child. I'm grown. I'm 18. Can I have some gas money? But you're grown. And it angers God when you disrespect even your adult parents. Before you do it again, ask somebody whose one or two parents are gone. I'm not going to lie to you. I get mad at my mama sometimes. I love Hazeline Davis, but she could work my nerves sometimes. But I would relive it all over again to have her sitting right here today. When, there's just, when brothers won't talk to each other, when sisters won't talk to each other, when cousins roll their eyes at family reunions, it angers God. And it angers God when there's dysfunction in the spiritual family. When you got preachers that won't talk to other preachers. When you've got mothers that won't speak to other mothers. When you got people ignoring the needs that are happening right in your own congregation. It angers God. And the Bible says God got mad because Miriam and Aaron were talking about Moses. He got so mad, he said, come out to the tabernacle. Just them. Now, this is important. God isolated the impact. Something the saints don't do. We like to spread the impact. God isolated the impact. Said, you three, come out here. To the tabernacle. They get out to the tabernacle, and God says, Yes, I speak to prophets, but Moses is not an ordinary prophet. Now, I'm just going to pose this question What if you're dealing with a Moses? Because the first thing you say, Well, he ain't Moses, but Moses ain't the last one God used like this. He said, everybody else, I deal with dreams and visions, but Moses, I speak to face to face. And there are some people, even sitting in this congregation, that God talks to you face to face. I know we don't carry this label, I'm a Moses, but there are some Moseses in the congregation. And you need to be careful, because I know you're anointed, but are you anointed like that? And... I don't mean this disrespectfully, but I want you to touch your neighbor and say, stay in your lane. Because it's a dangerous thing to get into the wrong lane. You can get run over getting in the wrong lane. So Moses calls them on, calls them out, challenges them, and says, why are you Acting against Moses. Now, here's the part. Everybody get your Bible. I want you to read this. I want you to read this. I want you to read this. Go back to Numbers chapter 12. I need you to read this. Here's the part that really got my attention. Numbers chapter 12. And I want you to notice, after God confronts them, verse 9, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. What I depend on, I'm just going to tell you this, what I depend on as the Lord's servant, as a pastor, as a preacher, is the presence of God. 
This whole church depends on the presence of God. If you're depending on anything else, it's the wrong stuff. If you're lining up behind anything else, it's the wrong stuff. If it's not the anointing of God, it really doesn't matter. Because without the glory of God, we are not refuge temple. We are Ichabod, meaning the glory of the Lord has departed. And I refuse to be in a church without the glory of the Lord. Oh, God, if I ever get a notice where God says I'm moving, I'm packing my stuff as soon as I get the notice. Because I can't do what is needed to be done without the presence of God. And God was so angry, oh, God, with Miriam and so angry with Aaron, he departed. Now, what happened when he departed? Miriam got leprosy. Because as long as the glory was there, yes, sir. Yes, sir. leprosy couldn't touch her. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There are some of you right now that ought to be dead. But the glory of God is on your life. So the heart attack couldn't take you. The glory of God is on your life. So the stroke couldn't take you. The glory of God is on your life. So diabetes couldn't take you. But if you walk away or if the glory walks away, anything. Everybody lift your hands. Let's give God praise right now. Everybody, everybody, everybody. When the glory leaves the house, oh my God, Satan takes control of the house. When the glory leaves the house, the flesh dominates the house. That's why it doesn't matter to me how well I preach in the eyes of other people. And it doesn't matter to me how well somebody sings because I'm not listening for the note. I know good music. I took music when I was in school. I know when some folk are out of tune. But what I'm listening for is the glory of the Lord, is the anointing in our midst. Glory left, leprosy came. And leprosy was metaphorically an image of sin. And it fell on Miriam. And you wonder why did it fall on Miriam and not on Aaron and Miriam? Ask God, I can't tell you why. But Miriam was stricken with leprosy. Her whole skin complexion, and it's ironic that God used leprosy because she was mad about skin color. Come on. God said, I'll put some color on you that you don't want. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I'll give you something you weren't looking for. And Miriam was struck by leprosy. And when Miriam was struck by leprosy, then Aaron began to plead and intercede. He should have prayed for her when she was running her mouth. But when the result broke out, now God, spare her. Now he wants to apologize. Now he wants to make it right with Moses. Now he wants to try to make up with Moses. But you know what? Deliverance didn't come until Moses started praying. Can I help somebody in here? Anybody here been victimized? Anybody here been hurt? Anybody here been ravaged by the enemy? God is still calling on you to pray for those that hurt you. To pray for those that despitefully use you. I had somebody, I'll never forget this. I had somebody not in this church who had done so much to disrespect me and my wife and our family. I mean, had done it, had done it, done it. Wasn't no question about it, wasn't suspicion. She had done damage. And I got a call that said, so-and-so is in the hospital and she doesn't know who she is. She's in the hospital, and they think they're going to lose her. And I was in a hotel room in another city somewhere preaching, and the Lord said, you got to get on your knees and pray for so-and-so. And, -so. and I, I'm not going to lie, I said, me? And the Lord said, yeah, you. 
Because we're not Christians. Oh, God, I hear you, Holy Ghost. Until we have learned how to forgive the way Jesus forgave. I don't care how much we shout. I don't care how much we speak in tongues. I don't care how much we quote scripture. You are not holy if you don't have the capacity to forgive. You can be as holy as you think you are. But if you don't know how to forgive, you ain't holy. And you might not even be saved. Because people who are saved know the depth of forgiveness. Anybody in this church know the Lord had to shed some blood to forgive you? Anybody in this church that messed up after you got saved, but the Lord still forgave you? I, this is not for everybody, but I need the honest people in Refuge Temple to thank God right now for forgiveness. He had mercy on me when I didn't know enough to take care of myself. He had mercy on me when I betrayed him and I strayed out of his will, but he still loved me. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good and his mercy endure forever I need about five people for about 30 seconds to thank God for mercy thank God for come on thank God for mercy I didn't deserve it I didn't earn it I should have been lost but he had mercy on me. Come on, come on, come on. Mercy, that was great. And grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden soul found liberty at Calvary. At Calvary. He washed my sins at Calvary. He forgave my sins at Calvary. He delivered my soul at Calvary. was healed by the prayer of Moses. Some of y'all did some folk wrong. And the one thing missing from your deliverance is an apology. You done cried at the altar. You've, you've cried, you've begged, you've shouted, you've spoken tongues. But the one thing that's missing is, Rebecca, I'm sorry. Oh, God. And trust me, a whole load is going to come off your shoulders when you just say, I'm sorry. Things are going to turn around when you start saying, I'm sorry. Things are going to get better when you start saying, I'm sorry. The people you lied on, the people you talked about, God is telling me to tell you, you got to open your mouth and say, I'm sorry. I had to apologize to my children. And by my estimation, I was and I am a good father. But even good fathers make mistakes. Even good mamas make mistakes. Even good children make mistakes. There's so much mess in our families that can be so easily resolved by an apology. And, and don't give that little fake church one. Told if I've done anything wrong. That's just a sorry apology. When you know time, place, and alibi. And you're going to say, if I've done anything wrong. You know exactly what you did. Ain't no deliverance in the if apology. There ain't no deliverance in them. Ain't no deliverance in the if apologies. You know you did wrong. You know you messed up. 
You know you lied. You know you caused confusion. You know you did it. So stop going with the if and say, you know what? I did wrong. The prodigal son did not say, if I sin. He said, Father, I've sinned before God and against you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Aaron pleaded for Miriam. Moses had to pray for Miriam. But I'm, I, I want you to get this. I'm closing. Bible says they put Miriam outside the camp for seven days. And so everything had to stop. I need y'all to get this. For seven days. This mindset, let me tell you that we just gonna walk, and if somebody breaks a loose, we just gonna keep on walking and leave them behind? That ain't of God. If we're family, come on somebody, we gonna wait. The Bible says tarry one for another. You know what that means? I'm gonna wait until God delivers you. We ain't gonna keep running without you. Because everybody in the body of Christ matters. And this mentality that I'm just going on with Jesus, I don't care what nobody does, that ain't God. That ain't God, yes. When the camp, when they put Miriam out, get out, Miriam. The whole camp stopped for seven days. No movement, no progress, no activity. For seven days. When Miriam got cleaned. Come on Miriam. She rejoined the group. And then we could keep going. Anybody following this? Anybody following this? There are too many people dying across the body of Christ. Sometimes I wish I didn't have social media. Because the mess I see on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook, all these people doing all this crazy stuff, thinking God is pleased. God ain't pleased with none of this mess. But the church is either ignoring it or, or and let me see, the other sin that we're committing is we just think everything is okay. Well, that's just them. God got to judge them. And they're your friend. So you're going to let your friend die and go to hell. And you cool with that. Please don't be my friend. I mean, seriously, unfriend me today. If you, if you can't pray for me, and if you can't confront me, yes. if your brother's overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore. That's half the problem. Most of us ain't spiritual. Because when we come, we come in flesh. And that's why it doesn't get anywhere. Because you all in your flesh, oh, I got something on Pastor Davis now. He's been preaching them 29 years. I got him today. That's the wrong spirit. That ain't love. That's the same spirit that Miriam and Aaron had. Got something on Moses because he married this Ethiopian woman. But when you're sincere about your correction, your correction makes sense. You know, when I die, when I die, there's going to be a big shout at my funeral. And it's going to be all the people who I know something about them. But I didn't tell him. Y'all ain't saying nothing. They're going to say, he dead now. He can't share it. And there's going to be this sigh of relief and this big shout. Because I still believe in confidentiality. That's right. That's right. Yes, sir. Might explain my stress numbers. Might explain my ball game. Because I'd rather carry it than put something on your back. 
where people will never accept you because of something that, and it wasn't a lie, it happened. It happened. It happened. But God let some people run up on somebody that believed that scripture about intercession. I got to stop. Lord, save my dysfunctional house. The dysfunctions that are in our families, they got to be healed. And you only get healed by forgiveness. Everybody in this church got a story about somebody who broke your heart. Look on your own and say, you ain't the only one. But I need you to know that you can't get better until you ask God for the grace to forgive. And let me just tell you this, they were not supposed to hurt you. And I'm not going to tell you that hurting was the will of God for your life. I'm not going to tell you that lie. Because some folks will say, well, it's just the will of God. He let it happen. No, some things happen by the will of people. God is sovereign. So he protected you in spite of it. And you ought to be thanking God right now that he protected you in spite of it. Because what was supposed to destroy your life. The other day, I was just thanking God. And Jerry, I started thanking God because I thought about all of the stuff that was supposed to end my life, end my walk with God, end my marriage, end the lives of my children. And when I thought about everything, I need you to think about everything. Anybody want to think? I know, I know the past is ugly, but I need you to think about everything for a moment. And when you think about everything that God allowed you to go through, but yet here you are on a Sunday morning when you ought to be in the cemetery, when you ought to be in the insane asylum, when you ought to be in the mental institution, when you ought to be in prison, here you are in the house of God. Is there anybody that's grateful right now? from the grateful hearts where's the praise from the folk that are not supposed to be here but the Lord has been good to you I got a moment for you to give God the best praise that you've got don't be cute about it don't be cute about it don't be cute about it but give God what belongs to him Anybody here willing to acknowledge that you have something for which you should repent? While we're sitting here, I need everybody to repent. Repent. And be thou converted till the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Repent, repent, repent. Even if I was trying to do the right thing, I did it the wrong way. You need to repent. You need to repent. You need to repent. Oh, shut up. 
reach your hand over to whoever's closest and just say, will you pray for me? I need the whole house to pray. Come here, son. I need the whole house to pray. And I need you to pray until the anointing comes on your row. Hey, I'm a katana. Don't be idle about it. Don't be disobedient. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Everybody pray. Hey, Shatama, Satana, Yeshiyanama. Lord, this is my son. I thank you for him. 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 Hey, God, and I want you to bless him. Hey, Shatanama, Satanama. Anything hindering him, anything holding him back, I rebuke it now in the name of Jesus. Hey, Shatama, I rebuke fear. I rebuke the tests and trials. I rebuke the mistakes of the past. Whatever is holding him now, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And I speak life over him. I speak life to Sophia. I speak life to his daughters. I speak life to his ministry. I speak life to the call of God that is on his life. Lord, cover him now in your precious blood. Lord, cover him now with your grace and your power. Lord, cover him now with your anointing. Endow him. Endow him. Endow him. Oh, Bless is going out and is coming in. Bless everywhere he puts his feet. Lord, sanction it for him now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you for him now. Oh, Everybody in this house, give God your best praise right now. Come on. Come on, everybody. 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 Lift your hands, church. And say, Lord, breathe on us. Lift your hands, church. And say, Lord, breathe on us. Lift your hands, church. And say, Lord, breathe. Lord, breathe. Lord, Anybody that needs salvation, anybody that needs healing, anybody that needs help, come on, get in the line. Only time I'm going to say it.
Anybody here want to be baptized in Jesus' name? If so, you can come down right now. We got water. We got clothes. Somebody to baptize you. You can come now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody that wants to be baptized in Jesus' name. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Everybody give God praise right now. Come on. Everybody bless the Lord. Everybody bless the Lord. Everybody bless the Lord. While the deacons and the ushers prepare for our giving, and if you need an envelope, raise your hands and somebody will serve you. And the deacons are preparing to receive our tithes and our offering. I've set aside a portion of this afternoon to pray with some people that want to receive the Holy Ghost, that want to be delivered. Because the Lord's presence is in this house right now. Oh, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There is a delivering spirit in the house right now.
Jesus, 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 Jesus,